Mrs. Kennedy makes one of her last stops in India before going on to Pakistan in the 400-year-old city of Udaipur. Here, accompanied by five Indian princes and two princesses, she goes for a boat ride on a man-made lake that surrounds the shining summer palace of the Maharana. The party returns to the palace for one of the glittering receptions that, along with the cheering throngs, have marked the First Lady's joyous conquest of the hearts of India. Welcome to today's video. In this video, I will be recreating the peach color dress that Jackie Kennedy wore on her 1962 trip to India. She wore so many beautiful and vibrant color pieces of clothing. However, I feel like the peach dress is the most notable from that trip. It's absolutely beautiful. I can totally see myself wearing this dress in everyday life because it's not too formal. One thing to note though, is that the fabric that I chose to recreate this dress was $34 a yard, $34 a yard. That is by far the most expensive fabric I've ever purchased in my life. I usually plan my projects, like my reconstructions, six to nine months in advance. So for example, the swim dress, I plan it like nine months in advance. So I was able to really take advantage of sales and wait until like dead stock websites like Fabric Mart had that come into their stock because they don't have a large selection, but everything is super affordable where Mood, for example, or other high-end stores in the garment district, they have a huge and beautiful wide selection of high quality fabrics. However, they are so, so expensive. So I kind of had to bite the bullet. I only planned this project like three to six weeks in advance. So I was constantly checking like dead stock fabric sites to see if they had any peach silk shunting in their collections. Thankfully, this dress is not too long. Skirt's not too voluminous. It's quite simple. So I only got myself four yards of fabric. If it was any more, I don't think I would have chosen that particular fabric. I would have probably just waited to do this project. So I was originally going to be draping my bodice because it is a princess themed bodice and I just wanted to make sure I got the fit absolutely right and I looked in my pattern stash to see if I had a 1960s pattern with a princess themed bodice and I really couldn't find anything. I found a few where the princess seam came from the shoulder instead of lower on the arm's eye which is how I kind of want to construct this bodice. So I made about two mock-ups of the bodice and they looked pretty good but then I looked in my pattern stash again and I actually did find a 1960s pattern with a princess seam that looks incredibly similar to the peach dress. Now I definitely I definitely don't mind draping. I actually draped a few princess themed bodices in the past. However, I don't know where those patterns have gone. I looked everywhere for them and I just can't find them. But if I have a pattern in my stash that is similar to the project that I want to recreate, I will always 100% choose the pattern over me draping and then patterning because it saves so much time. It saves me from getting my pattern paper out, a lot of extra work, and using a pattern lends a little bit more historical accuracy to the project, I feel like, because if I'm using an authentic 1960s pattern, I don't know, I just feel like that is just a tiny bit more historically accurate than me draping it myself. I mean, it doesn't matter really either way. So here is the pattern for the bodice. I'm obviously going to be using this one. So I'm going to, just like with all of my reconstructions, I adjust every single pattern. I never really cut into the pattern. I fold wherever I can, and if I need to cut, then I will get out my pattern paper and just make a new one. Instead of just a standard neckline, I'm going to be making a V-neckline that is very subtle and soft. That's actually insanely similar otherwise. I don't really need to change much at all. And then for the skirt, I will be using this pattern. I've actually worked with this pattern before. Now, the skirt on Jackie's dress is actually an inverted box pleat, so I will be just changing that slightly, and look at this little bow detail, this little bow belt detail, which is identical to Jackie's dress. So I feel like I'm pretty much covered on the pattern. I am so happy I found those in my stash. I felt like that was just such a great find that will save me time. When I do my reconstructions, I usually make a mock-up of only the bodice off camera. That way I can see if I need to make any final adjustments before I cut into my expensive fabric or my final fabric. Okay, let's get started. Jacqueline Kennedy Arnassus is undeniably one of the most influential style icons of the 20th century. Well, of all time, really. She also embodies everything about early 1960s dress, specifically affluent dress. She had immediate access to the most current designs and was a trendsetter in many ways. I feel like Jackie also defines what timeless elegance looks like. Many of her pieces would still be thought of as elegant and beautiful today. That's not something every decade can claim. I'm looking at you, 1980s. The person behind many of Jackie's timeless looks was a man named Oleg Cassini, who became known as the Secretary of Style to the White House. Oleg was appointed to be Jackie's exclusive dress coordinator. He once said, we are on the threshold of a new American elegance thanks to Mrs. Kennedy's beauty, naturalness, understatement, exposure, and symbolism. Jackie and Oleg worked together through her husband's presidency, collaborating on her wardrobe for official engagements, which would reflect on Jackie's personal 
sense of style. Jackie is particularly known for her boxy or straight suit skirts and dresses, her pillbox hats, innovative evening wear, and her simple A-line dresses, one of which I am creating today. In March of 1962, Jackie and her sister Lee traveled to India and Pakistan on a diplomatic tour. Her wardrobe took inspiration from the country she was to visit and were vibrant and colorful. A perfect example of this was the peach dress she wore on March 17th on a daytime boat ride around Lake Pichula in Udapur, India. The peach dress was created by Cassini and is a sleeveless knee-length dress with a soft V neckline. The dress is gathered at the waist, which is accented with a bow. The dress also comes with a boxy coat in a similar color and fabric. So the dress is made out of silk zimberline, which I've never heard of until researching this video. Zimberline refers to a heavy silk fabric with a twill weave, very similar to Mikado. They used this fabric because it was rigid enough to keep its composure in the heat of India. I obviously couldn't find silk zimberline anywhere, so I settled with silk shanting. So I am looking for an orange thread that matches my fabric or like a light peach thread. I have like an entire rainbow of thread. In this drawer, I couldn't really find anything that really suited the color of the fabric. Then I go over to my other thread drawer, this large collection of vintage thread. And I really, I can't find anything that's like spot on. Like this one is somewhat similar. I barely have any orange I, and I thought I had every color, but I guess I don't have orange. So these are the three that I thought maybe definitely not that. This though could be a contender, maybe this. And the camera, it looks more yellow, but in, I think in real life, it's a little more peachy. I mean, regardless, the thread really won't be seen anyway, but yeah. I get all my thread on eBay secondhand because I need thread that isn't like diagonally woven on the spool in order to work on my um, 1950s sewing machine. Generally, it's all cotton and not polyester, which I'd prefer to buy. And if I could buy secondhand, that's awesome as well. That way I'm not like supporting the supply chain of consumption. But yeah, I, I thought I had enough thread to last me for all of the projects for the rest of my life. Maybe I'll have to look and see if there are any neutrals that they're selling on eBay. So right now I am threading my sewing machine. I am getting ready to sew my bodice pieces together as well as the bodice darts. As I said in my last video, analyzing the costumes in the film Jackie, early 1960s style was very similar to late 50s style. Many people envision 1960s dress as mini skirts, peace signs, and round sunglasses. However, this is not the whole picture. Mini skirts did not come into mainstream popularity until the mid to late 1960s, and these styles were mainly worn by teens and young adults when they first became popular. The 1960s is characterized by many different substyles. For for example, it was only a small subset of the population who wore what was considered hippie dress, even at its most popular. Regular middle or lower class people generally wore their clothing until it was no longer suitable for wear. Only socialites and the affluent could afford to keep up with the most current styles. Remember, clothing in the mid 20th century was much more expensive than it is today. In 1960, an average American household spent over 10% of its income on clothing and shoes, which is equivalent to roughly $4,000 today. The average person bought fewer than 25 garments each year, and about 95% of those clothes were made in the United States. Today, the average American household spends less than 3.5% of its income on clothing and shoes, which is roughly under $1,800. Yet we buy more clothing than ever before. Nearly 20 billion garments, billion, yes, I said billion with the B, garments a year. That is close to 70 pieces of clothing per person, or more than one clothing purchase per week. Look at that neckline. I cannot recommend understitching enough. You get such a like a clean and professional neckline and armholes. I have to do those though. The facings kind of take a while. That's why I just like to line stuff usually. And I really should have just lined this bodice because I feel like the fabric is somewhat see-through. You'd think $34 a yard silk wouldn't be see-through, but I was wearing my red dress and I put it up to my dress. You could see the red through it. So I was just like, what? I don't know. Can you see the facing through it? You kind of can. Uh, at this point, obviously there's no going back, but we're going to recreate this dress. Definitely line it I would say
So this is the bodice so far. I just finished the armhole facings and I really love the way it fits. So next I'll be moving on to doing the skirt and making the belt as well. I'm kind of tempted to do a video on fast fashion in the future and why America stopped making its own clothing, but that's for another day. Anyway, so trends didn't evolve as quickly as they do today because fast fashion didn't exist yet. And even when trends did evolve, it was considered frivolous to throw away perfectly good clothing. New styles were slowly incorporated into the average person's wardrobe, and many women altered their clothing to appear more current. Like for example, in the 1960s, skirts became slimmer and less voluminous. So all women had to do was exchange their full petticoats for a simple slip in order to continue wearing their 1950s dresses and skirts. So I just sewed the front panel to the two side panels and I'm preparing them for a French seam since this fabric seems to fray more than chiffon, which is interesting. I don't quite understand how a tighter weaved silk would fray more than chiffon, but alas, here we are. So I'm going to get onto that while being diligent to press in between. And I am also going to fold the pleat on the front of the skirt. Since Jackie was first lady of the United States, it was vital to her and her husband's image that she purchase her clothing from American department stores and designers. You might be asking, but she wore Chanel, Dior, and Givenchy regularly. I mean, wasn't her iconic pink suit Chanel? Well, yes. Here is how things worked. Shay Ninan, a high-end boutique located in Midtown Manhattan, supplied the first lady with exact copies of French and Italian couture designs. Every custom look was designed in Europe, American made, and it was completely legal. So how it worked was staff from the boutique would attend European fashion shows each season, choose their favorite pieces, and then pay for the rights to produce those designs under a license from the original designers. Shay Ninan created these couture lookalikes with the same buttons, trim, and fabric as the original, and were pretty much always supplied directly from the original designer. The only thing that differed was that the couture employed specialty handwork, which made the pieces wildly expensive. Shay Ninan used machine work in place of handwork in order to kind of keep costs down. The boutique sat closed shop in 1966 due to the growing availability of couture, but the empire of Shay lives on fondly through the memories of the New York fashion industry. Okay, so I am just about finished constructing the bow. I love making fabric bows. I feel like they really add to a garment. So next I'm moving on to constructing the belt. I've used this pattern before, and when I cut the belt out, it was actually way too small for my waist. So I made sure to add extra length to this belt so it will give me a little more room and then some. After I sewed the belt and turned it inside out, I hand sewed the bow to the end of the belt. I just finished the belt. It's so cute, yay. Finally, I am onto the hem and then I will be finished. So I am doing a double fold hem, which works nicely with this simple A-line skirt. I just put the zipper in um, off camera and now I'm going to be sewing up the back seam. Okay, it is time to give her a final press and then we can move on to the reveal. Jackie Kennedy Onassis has always been one of my biggest role models and style icons. I love that I got to create something similar to what she wore. I can't wait to reproduce more pieces of her clothing in future videos. A few things to note about this project that I wish I did differently. I wish I lined or interfaced the bodice and skirt to lend a little more stiffness to the dress. All the previous silk shonding I worked with was a bit thicker than this fabric and I didn't really catch how thin it was 
until I already finished constructing the bodice. So I will probably go back and do that at some point to give the dress more shape and make it a little less wrinkly because I pressed this dress for like 20 minutes and as soon as I looked at it the wrong way, it wrinkled. Design-wise, I feel everything is pretty spot on minus the inverted box pleat in the front that should have been a little closer together, but I personally like it further apart. The bow is also a little droopy, so I might starch that or add another hook and eye to get that to stand up better. Anyway, if you enjoyed this project and the accompanying dress history, go ahead and subscribe. There's plenty more cozy historical sewing content to come. Have a great week otherwise. Bye.